Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you here this morning. I'm glad to be here. I hope you are too. We've been able to sing together and pray together and remember the Lord's death until He comes again, and now we can open God's divine book and glean some of the rich treasures that are found therein. I was just thinking while we were singing a moment ago, and I appreciate the one who led the songs. I appreciate the beautiful songs that he led. I'll tell you what, folks. One of the things I, I remember about this group and I, I really miss about this group is the great singing that you have here. I work for a little, with a little group. We're pretty small. We sing as best we can, but it really sounded good this morning. In fact, I've, I almost said, let's don't, let's don't have any preaching. Let's just keep singing. I think that'd been all right, because when we sing, we teach and admonish one another, don't we? And I appreciate that very much. It's good to be back with you. I appreciate the elders inviting me to be with you this morning and talk to you about some things that might cause us to draw closer to God or be more circumspect in our service unto Almighty God. You know, the thing, a lot of things happen to us in life, don't they? There are things that are, are wonderful. There are great joys that we have. A baby is born to a young family and what joy there is in that. But then death comes and what sorrow there is in that from time to time. We lose a, a mother or a father or maybe we even lose a child. We lose individuals we've been so close to. It brings such great grief to us. Life is hard sometimes. It's difficult sometimes. And because of that, we might become so depressed of the things that are happening to us, we just decide to give up. I know sometimes I hear people say, well, there are so many troubles in the church I just don't want to worship God anymore. I don't want to serve the Lord anymore. I'm going to leave this church, or I'm going to leave my family, and they'll miss me. They'll, they'll wish that they'd treated me better, and then that person quits. What they don't realize is oftentimes, when they're left, they might be forgotten. And they're really not missed a lot of times when they leave. But the fact of the matter is, we let circumstances in life, if we're not very careful, we let the circumstances in life direct our, our mind and our, our energy in serving the Lord. And as I've preached for so many years, I've seen so many people who claim to be children of God who were very faithful at one time in their life, but because of the circumstances that have happened to them, they've quit serving the Lord. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. Maybe a husband or a wife died, and the partner decided, well, if the Lord's going to do that to me, if he's not going to help me in regard to that, I'm not going to serve him anymore. Well, I'll tell you, folks, the Lord never did promise us that this life would be without difficulty. The Lord never promised that. What He did promise us, though, if we get through this life, if we're faithful till we die, He said, I'll give you the crown of life. That's what He said in Revelation 2 and verse 10. When He was speaking that, when John was writing that to, to one of those seven churches of Asia, He was basically telling them, folks, I want to tell you something. You may die a terrible death. If you think about the history at that time, Rome was in control of the world. And there were Caesars in Rome who claimed that they were God. And they required people to bow down to them. Well, a Christian could not do that. Because he realized there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all. And he realized that we can't serve any other God, that we can't serve a God in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth because... Jehovah God is a jealous God, and Him only shall we serve. We understand that as children of God. So there were Christians in the time that Rome was directing the affairs of the earth and ruling the earth that would not bow down to Caesar. They wouldn't bow down to Caesar. I cannot worship Him. There's one God. And what would happen to them is they would put in the, be put in the Roman arena, and they would be torn to pieces by the wild animals that were in the Roman arena. We really have it a lot better than that, don't we, in our society? In America, we have things a whole lot better than that. It's pretty, it's pretty sad in some countries in, our, in the world today that when, they try, when people try to worship God, they are persecuted, sometimes they're put to death, but that's not so in America, is it? At least not so far it's not so. And yet these individuals were told by the Lord, and remember that when John writes what he does, he's writing the mind of Christ. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16 when he said, we have the mind of Christ. So when the, John was writing the book we call Revelation, when he was writing that and revealing this 
to this seven, one of these seven churches of Asia said, if you'll be faithful till you die. And that's Christ speaking to them. What's Christ saying? James, I'll tell you what, if we were to bring it into our day and age, James, I'll tell you, if you'll follow me till the day you die, I'll give you the crown of life. And it may be very difficult, but don't you quit. Don't you quit serving me. You follow me in spite of the fact it may be difficult, it may be very hard for you. And don't get to the point you say, the harder I try, the worse it gets. And sometimes we preachers, if we're really honest with ourselves, sometimes we get so frustrated that because we preach and teach and people don't respond. And what happens to us from time to time, if we don't have a real good wife who talks to us, so what happens to us from time to time is what we'll say is, there's no use, I'm just spinning my wheels. And I saw some preachers that have quit preaching because of that. They just quit when they had the talent, they had the ability, they had the Word of God, and they could speak to people, but they quit. And sometimes Christians do that. Sometimes those of us who claim that we love the Lord, we don't show that in our life. And we quit serving the Lord. In the Old Testament, there are examples of individuals, lots of examples, of course, but there are examples of individuals who went through very difficult times. You know, one of the reasons that the Old Testament is written, I realize the primary thing is that it points toward Christ. I understand that. But one of the other reasons that the Old Testament was written was to tell us the relationship that God had with some of His people and the relationship that some of those people had with Almighty God. And the Apostle Paul says the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. We learn something by studying history. Most of you out there, if you've gone go to any kind of a school, you understand that you, about history, don't you? Most of you have studied history. One of the reasons that we study American history is we want to know what caused this country to exist. And we study American history and we see what people had to do in order that you and I can sit in the pew today without worrying about some soldiers coming in, lining us up against the wall and shooting every one of us because we worship God. We live in a great country. Yes, there are problems. There are difficulties. Some people are not living like they ought to. I understand all that. But we live in a place, in an area, where we can worship God without any fear. We can do that. Well, in the Old Testament, there were people, though, that they had, they went through many trials, but they continued to serve the Lord. And I want to look at some today. We learn something by studying history. It was written for our learning that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And we should be inspired by the faith of those who have gone before us. There's a great chapter, isn't there, in the New Testament. We'll look at it a little bit later on. But there's a great chapter in the New Testament. We call it the Hall of Faith, Hebrews the 11th chapter. It talks about what happened in the Old Testament, what people went through to serve the Lord. And yet they continued to serve the Lord. But let's look at some specifics of individuals who are examples to us today of people despite what was happening to them, they continued to serve God, to serve Jehovah God. One of those, of course, is Noah. Go back way into the Old Testament, we read about Noah, don't we? In the Old Testament, Noah prepared an ark for 120 years he spent building an ark. You think about that, 120 years. You know, sometimes we want a new house, they'll tell us it's going to take six to eight months to build a house or maybe a year, and we think, that's a long time. But Noah spent 120 years building an ark. Why? Because here in that period of time, the Scripture says he was a preacher of righteousness. He was talking to people about their sin that was going to bring about the destruction of the world at that time. We read about the flood, don't we? It covered the world. But Noah was an individual who served God. And he's an example for us today. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter and verse 7, we read about that. The apostle writer to the Hebrews reminds them of this faith that we're talking about from Hebrews 11. He said, By faith Noah was warned of God concerning things he had not seen as yet. I want you to think about that for a moment. He was warned of God about something that had never happened before. And yet his faith was so strong that he listened to what God had to say. Something he had never seen before. I've talked to people in the last few years, in the last weeks and so on, I've talked to people for every once in a while, they'll talk about buying stocks. 
know whether any of you ever bought any stocks or not. But they'll talk about the fact, you know, I had an opportunity one time to buy Netflix. I don't know whether you know what Netflix is or not. All these young people do, I guarantee you. I had a chance to buy Netflix, and I had a chance to buy it. Did you know you could buy it one time for a dollar and 18 cents? Did you know that? If you had an opportunity now to do it, would you do it? But a lot of people didn't do it, even though it was offered to them. They had a chance to do it. Everybody could have bought some of that stock, but they didn't do it because they couldn't see the end of that. They couldn't see what it would do today. Or how about Amazon? Or some of the others today that are, are, are Google, or some of those that people could have bought stock, and they could have been set for life. Well, I'm not telling you to buy stock. I'm just using it as an example of the fact that sometimes we don't see the future. We don't know what's going to happen, and that keeps us from doing what we could have done. Noah was warned of God concerning something he had never seen. And you think about that living at that particular time, and God speaks to Noah and says, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. Why? That's never happened. We get rain from time to time, but it doesn't cover everything. Never has. But Noah didn't believe that. He believed God. He had faith. When the Apostle Paul was talking about faith, he said, we walk by faith, we don't walk by sight. Noah was not walking by sight because he couldn't see what was going to happen. It had never happened before, but he was walking by faith. And the Bible says he prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I'm going to do that. Some of you, no doubt, have saved up some money for your latter years. Some of you may be saving some money for your children so they can go to college or whatever it is. And the reason you're doing that is because you're looking into the future. You realize this is going to happen someday. My son or daughter is going to grow up. We were talking to somebody just a few moments ago and one of their children is about to graduate, and I can't believe that. I can remember that child down here when I was here. But the fact of the matter is people grow up, so we save money. We make plans for those kind of things. Noah was warned of God concerning things he had not seen. And he was moved with godly fear. That is, he honored the Lord so much, he had so much fear and oblations toward God that he did what God told him to do. And he prepared an ark to the saving of his house, through which he condemned the world because they wouldn't do that. Can you just picture this? Think about this. Noah's out there and he's building an ark. And it's not just a little boat. It's an ark. And he's going to take animals into it. And can you imagine while he's building that, people walking by, worldly people walking by and saying, this is silly, Noah. This is ridiculous that you do that. The world's never been destroyed by a flood. He condemned, condemned the world when he did what God said, and he became an heir of God. He became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith, the Hebrew writer says. So Noah's an example for us, isn't he? Of an individual despite the world at that time, and the majority of the people were crying out against it, the majority of the people were living another way. No doubt they ridiculed him and did a lot of things that might cause an other individual not to serve the Lord, but Noah continued to serve the Lord. Well, let's look at another one. In Hebrews the 11th chapter and verse 8, we read about Abraham. Abraham is another example that's given to us. Why is the Old Testament written, folks? Why is it written? Because we can read about Noah, and we can read about Abraham, and it's not just some nice story that we can read to our children before they go to bed at night. There's a reason for the writing of the Old Testament. It was written for us to learn something. We learn by looking at these wonderful characters in the Old Testament what it means to serve the Lord under trying circumstances and not to quit. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, we're told, he obeyed to go unto a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, listen to this, and didn't even know where he was going. He didn't know where he was going. He's just doing what the Lord tells him to do. When you get in your car and go, and you're going to take a trip, do you just go not knowing where you're going? Well, once in a while it happens to me, Marty will say, weren't you supposed to turn there? And I look at her and I say, well, I, I, wanted to, I wanted you to see some new country. <laughs> the, fact of the fact of the matter is, I didn't know where I was going. And, and it's good to have a wife, folks. I have a wonderful wife who helps me in life. She is that helpmeet that the Old Testament said a wife ought to be. 
That's what she is. But there are times when an individual is, might be going someplace, but he doesn't know where he's going. But Abraham obeyed God. God told him to go, and he went. And it was a difficult journey. A lot of things happened to Abraham on that journey. But Abraham believed God, and he went to receive this place. He went out, and he did not know where he went. In other words, he accepted the teaching of Almighty God. Way back in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah points out something. It's as if God is speaking, Jehovah God speaking through Isaiah. In Isaiah, the 50th chapter, verses 8 and 9, Jehovah God speaks through Isaiah and says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. So let's make it apply to us today. As if the Lord speaking directly to James Lusby today, said, James, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. You listen to me. Don't argue with me. Don't decide you're going to quit because you can't see the, the forest for the trees. But I want you to obey and do the things I tell you to do. My ways are not your ways, saith Jehovah. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, he says. Abraham believed that. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God and did what God told him to do. And it didn't make any difference how difficult the, the trek was, the trip was. He obeyed God. Even though he didn't know where he was going, he just followed God's will. And he never quit. Well, let's look at another one. Let's think about Moses for a moment. Moses is one of the great characters of the Old Testament. You were studying something about him in your class this morning, in the auditorium class. Moses was a great prophet of God. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses was a wonderful prophet of God. In Hebrews 11, chapter, verses 24 through 26, we read that Moses walked by faith. Now Moses walked by faith, and remember what Paul said? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And faith, what the Apostle Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight. So Moses did what God told him to do too, just like Noah did, just like Abraham did. But the Scripture says Noah refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter when he was grown up. Let's set this for a moment. Noah was found in a little container by Pharaoh's daughter. And she took him to raise him as her own son. You can read this in the Old Testament. You can also read it in the Hebrews, the 11th chapter. But she, was, she took him to raise him as her own, and now he's grown up. And I want you to think about the fact that he lives in the courts of Pharaoh. We're talking about a time when Egypt was the ruler of the world. And Pharaoh was the dominant king. And you think about what a king would dress in, the finest of the finest cloth, and the jewels that he might have. And a son of Pharaoh, or a son of Pharaoh's daughter, would have all of those wonderful things that are given because you're a part of the court of Pharaoh. And when he was grown up, rather than accepting all those things, rather than putting on all those robes, Rather than wearing all of those jewels, the Scripture says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? Why'd you do that? Why'd you do that, Moses? Because I chose to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, I'll tell you what, folks. We could quit serving the Lord today. And it might be that it would be a lot more fun Young people, it might be that there'd be a lot more pleasure by going out in the world and doing what everybody else asks you to do. What the world wants you to do. And receive the things of the world and accolades of the world. And to be put on a pedestal because you're following the things of the world. And everybody likes you. And I don't know anybody that doesn't really want to be liked. But everybody's going to like me because I do the same things that they do and we all do this together and it's a wonderful life and how much fun I'm having on Saturday night or Friday night or whenever it is. You think about the fun that Pharaoh's daughter's son would have had had he continued to follow the, the teachings and the trappings of Egypt. But he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter rather choosing ill treatment with the people of God 
than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Let me tell you something. Sin lasts only for a short period of time. Oh, it might last for 70 years. It might last for 80, depending on how long we live. But it only lasts for a short period of time. The pleasure of sin. And I'll tell you what, folks. The reason people sin is because it's pleasurable. That's what this passage is talking about. The reason people sin is because it's fun. It really is. But it only lasts for a season because the end result of sin, the wages of sin, Paul said, is death. Now, it could be physical death from time to time. Sometimes people do things that cause them to die physically because they, they sinned against what's right. But I think the Apostle Paul in Romans 6, 23 is really talking about spiritual death there. A person might go through life and have all the pleasures of life, enjoy everything, have the best cars, the best home, the best clothes, the best everything. But someday he's going to stand before the Lord, and each one will stand before the Lord and be judged by the things they've done in the body, whether they be good or bad, the Apostle Paul said. Moses understood that. Even though it was difficult, listen, he said, choosing rather to suffer ill treatment with the people of God, or one translation says, share ill treatment with the people of God. It wasn't going to be pleasant. This is in direct contrast to what the passage says when it says the pleasures of sin. He could have had the pleasures of sin. He could have worn those royal robes and rode in that great chariot. And it would have been fun. And everybody would have bowed down to him. And he could have had the Israelite slaves build him an edifice of some kind somewhere. He could have had everything in it, but he chose to, draw, to share ill treatment with the people of God. That means they were serving God they didn't enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The passage goes ahead to say in verse 26, He accounted the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Why did you do that, Moses? Why didn't you just go ahead and stay? Look at all the things you would have had. You might have been able to drive a new Lincoln or a new Cadillac. You might have had the best SUV that's out there. You could have had a, lake, a, a house on the lake. You could have had all of these things. You might have even owned your own vineyard. You might have owned your own island somewhere. You might have had all of those things. But what Moses did, he looked under the recompense of reward. You see, he could see the forest and not just see the trees. And sometimes what happens to us is we see all the trees out here we don't see that beautiful forest on down the road. And that's what happens. And when we just see the, the immediate things, we, well, I, I'm not getting anything. And what causes us sometimes to quit serving the Lord is because we just see the immediate. We don't see the rest of it. But Moses did. Let's think about the Apostle Paul just for a moment. We like to talk about the Apostle Paul from time to time, don't we? The Apostle Paul was an individual who had persecuted Christians at one time. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me on one occasion? Saul was told, he was called Saul then, later on Paul. Saul was told to go into Damascus and there it would be signified unto him everything he had to do about what he had been doing. There was a prophet came to him and told him to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. That's exactly what he did. And he remembers, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, howbeit I obtained mercy, he said. Mercy from the Lord. And he obeyed the Lord. He did the things the Lord would have him do. And later on, he preaches the very thing about Jesus Christ that he used to deny. And when he began to do that, then those same friends he used to have turned against him, didn't they? And the Jews as a whole turned against the Apostle Paul and they threw him out of a city one time, and they stoned him and left him for dead. You think about how bad it got for Paul after he obeyed the gospel. Before he obeyed the gospel, why, he had letters of the high priest. He could go into the, into the high priest and ask for something people his own age couldn't ask for. He was more zealous than people his own age, the Bible says. So he got these letters, and he was going to cast all who were of the way into prison, both men and women. All of them. And he was very popular because he was following the crowd. 
But when he quit following the crowd, when he started to follow Jesus Christ, something happened. A reverse took place. Now all of a sudden, he's one of the ones that's being persecuted. He's one of the ones they're talking about. The Jews said, we'll neither eat nor drink till we take his life. That didn't happen when he was following the crowd. So what did Paul say a little bit later on? He said, as much as in me is, I want to preach the gospel. Why did he do that? Because he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Folks, when we get to the point that for us to really live is Christ, to think about Christ, He dominates our thought. He is the one we look to. We listen to Him. He guides us in every way we go. We live for Christ. We don't just say we do, but Christ dwells in us. And Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. When you get to that point, you're not going to quit Christ no matter what happens. You're not going to quit serving the Lord. For me to live is Christ. And the reason, the end result of living for Christ, listen to this, folks, is exactly what Jesus said. Paul said, the end result of living for Christ, I, I live for Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Jesus said, if you'll be faithful to me, Paul, if you'll live faithful till you die, I'll give you the crown of life. What did Paul say? Let's think about what Paul said about himself. He's an example too. In fact, he said in 1 Corinthians 11, I want you to be followers of me as I also am of Christ. Or one translation says, imitators of me. He says unto the Philippians, you have me as an example. Let's all walk by my example, he said. Here's the apostle Paul said, this is the thing that I did. And later on, he, he speaks to Timothy and he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the case course I have kept the faith and there's later for me a crown of righteousness Paul why did you fight folks being a child of God means you're in a fight I'm not talking about you're in a fight with this young lady down here or these people down here I'm talking about you're in a fight with sin you're in a fight with the devil he wants to take you to hell have you ever thought about the devil for a minute now he really doesn't wear a red suit and he doesn't have a forked tail. And he doesn't have fire coming out of his mouth because if he did and had this pitchfork out here, you wouldn't pay any attention to him. You'd probably run, wouldn't you? The devil's that one that comes to you and whispers things in your ear. He's the individual who will take your life. And he wants you to spend eternity with him in hell. You see, hell was made for the devil and his angels, and he wants to have all of you there too. That's what he wants. But the Apostle Paul said, look, I have fought the good fight. And when he was speaking to the Ephesians, Ephesians the 6th chapter, he said, I want you to put on the whole armor of God. Why would you need to put on armor? Because the devil is firing his darts at you. Or we might say his arrows at you. He knows what your temptations are, and he's going to make sure that he puts that temptation before you so you'll turn away from the Lord and you'll quit. And it could be the death of a person. It could be the loss of a job. It could be members of the church who talk about you in an ungodly way, and they'll pay for that someday, but they talk about you in an ungodly way. He wants you to quit serving the Lord because He wants you to be in hell with Him. He doesn't want to just be there with His angels. He wants a lot of people there too. But the Apostle Paul said, I have fought good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. And he tells Christians, I want you to put on the whole armor of God, and then that armor is the shield of faith by which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. And after he told the people to put on the whole armor of God, the Apostle Paul said, after you've done all to stand, stand! That's what he said. Stand! Don't let the world destroy you. Let's quit just serving the Lord when everything is fine. Everything's going the way we want it to go. Let's serve the Lord even when it isn't. Let's fight the good fight. Let's finish the course. Let's keep the faith. Because Paul didn't say it's just going to be given to me. He said it's to all them that have loved His appearing. Isn't he saying the same thing the Lord said in Revelation 2? Isn't that what he's saying? You be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And he will. If we didn't believe Christ would do that, what are we doing serving Him in the first place? If He doesn't tell us the truth at other times, why would we serve Him now? But we know the Lord doesn't lie, does He? 
And we know he's always kept his promises, and he'll keep that promise for us, don't we? We know we can do that. We can overcome the world with Jesus Christ. I'll tell you how we can quit, keep from quitting. We can do exactly what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews, the 12th chapter and verse 2, when he said, fix your eyes on Jesus. We have so many people, he said, as an example to us. And that, that's chapter 11 of Hebrews, that chapter on faith. Since we're surrounded by sort of such a great cloud of witnesses, let, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us look unto Jesus or fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When you look at that passage in Hebrews 12, when the Apostle Paul is talking about, I believe it's the Apostle Paul, but whoever it is, whoever you think it is, when the Apostle says, who for the joy that was set before him, I've read people who try to say, well, what he's talking about there is he gets to go to heaven again. Well, maybe. That may be part of it. Because he did ask his father in John the 17th, to, 17 rather, to have the glory that he once had with his father, to have it restored to him. So that could be part of it. But what I think he's talking about there, the reason that Jesus Christ endured the cross was for you and me. I hear people sometimes talk about a personal Savior. He's very personal, isn't he? I want you to think about that. Jesus Christ died for James Lusby. You know how many people know me? You know how important I am in the world? If I ever get the big head, what I need to do is do what my father said that people need to do from time to time. That is, fill a bathtub with water, put your finger in the water, pull it out and see how long the hole lasts. That's about how important we are in the scheme of things. But we are so important to the Lord that He died on the cross for us. That's what He did. So we look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and for the joy that was set before Him, what happened? He endured the cross and He despised the shame. And when you think about the cross, folks, it's not just like what we're thinking about on Easter. When people think about Easter and they put a cross out there somewhere. We've got to understand what it means that Jesus Christ went through when he was there on the cross. The crosses of the Romans, when they crucified somebody on the cross, it was reserved for the worst criminal that could exist. They put rapists and thieves and murderers on the cross. Jesus Christ was hanging between two thieves. He endured the cross. The shame of the cross of the fact that when people look, he must be a terrible person or he wouldn't be dying on the cross. He endured the cross the shame of the cross. He despised that shame because it put him in with the worst possible criminals in the world. But the joy that he had was when I die on that cross, James Lusby and the rest of those who will follow me till they die, they'll receive the crown of life. That was the joy. Well, I know he's going to go back to his father. understand that. The passage says he... He's going to sit at the right hand of God. I understand all that, and that's wonderful to think about. But he endured the cross and despised the shame for the joy that was going to come. God commended his own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the Roman writer said. And that great, beautiful passage. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the joy. That's the joy. There's no reason for us to ever quit serving the Lord because of what we're going to have. You think about the fact that there is reserved for us in a place we call heaven. And in that place, there's a street of gold. Did you ever walk in one of those? I never have. But the Lord has to use terms, see, that we can understand since we're mortal. So he used a term about a, a street of gold, and you can walk on a street of gold. And you can gaze on a jasper wall and you'll never cry again. You'll never have a tear again. I was talking with Dale a few moments ago and we were talking about golf. We both used to play together a lot. I guess, Dale, if we still play golf in heaven, we'll shoot par every time. But of course, there won't be a golf. We won't be interested in that, will we? 
But the whole point of that is, we'll have all of that, the great and richness of heaven, and we'll be in the presence of Almighty God and of Jesus Christ, and we'll see Him as He is. You think about having all that if you don't quit serving the Lord. And the way to keep from quitting is fix your eyes on Jesus. These things are happening all out here. But yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because I want to go to heaven someday. That's what I'll do. You've got song books out there. Turn with me to number 184. Number 184. Look, I want you to think about what you have in Jesus. In Jesus. And the joy we ought to have that keeps us from quitting anything because we're going to serve Him. Without Him, we'd have nothing. Number 184. Without Him, I could do nothing. Without Sing that song. Next time you decide the world it's just not worth it to serve the Lord, sing that song. And that'll help you. That's why I said singing. You're singing here. Oh, man. You're raising the rafter. In fact, I, saw, I think I saw a crack out there. You're singing so much. It's wonderful to be with a group of people that love to sing. Don't ever quit. Sing this song. If any is happy, if any rejoices, let him sing praises unto God. Let's do that together as children of God, okay? The song we're about to sing is number 325. I want you to look at the last verse. We'll sing them all, I'm sure, but let's look at the last verse. Here's the resolution that a child of God has to make and why he does. I am resolved, I am resolved to enter the kingdom. I'm resolved. I'm not going to leave the path. I'm not, I'm not going to follow the paths of sin. I'm going to leave the paths of sin, he says. Friends may oppose me. That's what we were talking about earlier. Foes may beset me. And still, I'm going to enter in. And he says, I will hasten. I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get to heaven, can you? What was it Paul said? Come, Lord Jesus. And he said that more than once. I will hasten, hasten to him. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Well, how do we do that? We start by giving our lives to the Lord. We call it obeying the gospel sometimes. Well, what it means is you're going to give your life to the Lord. You're going to live for Jesus. 
And you're going to do that by simply stating, I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you're going to change your life. You're going to repent of whatever you did in the past, whatever kind of life you had in the past. You're going to start a new direction. That's what repentance means. It means a change of mind that produces a change of direction. Now my direction is toward the Lord. Now I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus and I'm going to do something about those sins I had before, so I'm going to be baptized into Christ and wash away my sins. I want the remission of my sins. That's what Peter told a group of people to do who were guilty of sin in Acts 2. And let me tell you something, folks. If you think you can't go to heaven because you've just been so bad, I want you to think about those people on the day of Pentecost, those Jews who were very religious, who had gathered from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem to worship God. These are some of the same people that when Jesus was hanging there or about to hang on the cross, they said, crucify Him, crucify Him. They had murdered the Son of God. And when Peter and the rest of the apostles preached to them, particularly Peter's sermon, he said, you by the hand of lawless men did crucify and slay. And let me let, let you know something. God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And the Scripture says they were cut to the quick. They were pricked in their heart. They were scared to death. We murdered the Son of God. We now know what we did. What can we do about it, Peter? And Peter said, Repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they gladly received His word. And they were baptized. Now listen to this. And the Lord added them to the saved. Now folks, if He could save people that murdered His Son, He can save you. Let's don't quit. Let's serve the Lord. Let's go to heaven when we die. And if the whole world doesn't want to listen to the Lord, if the whole world wants to go to hell, let them. Now you can try to keep them from it, but if that's what they're determined to do, let them. And if you're the only one that goes to heaven, just make the resolution to say, I'm going to heaven. If nobody else does, I'm going to heaven. But that's not the way it has to be. Everybody in this audience can go to heaven. If you'll just serve the Lord till the day you die. I'll give you the crown of life. I'd like to help you have that. I'd like to help you get that if I can. I'd like to help you obey the Lord. I'd like to help you do what the Lord would have you do. And if you haven't obeyed the God, if you've not been baptized into Christ, do so today. Wash away your sins today. And if you've not been living the way that you ought to live, if you've fallen away from Christ, you can come back to the Lord. Confess your sins. Jesus said He about this. He's faithful and righteous to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You can go to heaven. Can I help you do that? As together we stand and sing.